Today, I am joined by Brian Hecht, who is a 25-year veteran of the digital startup scene and has founded, operated, and exited multiple companies. He is now a venture partner at ERA, the Entrepreneur's Roundtable Accelerator, where he invests in early stage startup and coaches them on how to grow their companies, raise further investment, and most importantly, tell their stories. Brian, thank you so much for joining today. My pleasure. It's going to be a lot of fun. So you yourself clearly have an entrepreneurial spirit. What has been the continued driving force behind this? Well, uh, I don't think I always had an entrepreneurial spirit as, uh, as you know, traditionally defined. I came out of college and I wanted to be a journalist, um, which uh, is on the one hand sort of telling interesting stories, but there's just a lot of legwork in doing it. And uh, sort of what got me started is uh, I was working at ABC News Television. Um, and, uh, you know, as a junior person, I was logging tape and all of that stuff. And that was fine. And then a startup very early in the internet age in 1994, like before the internet really existed, um, I was brought in to consult on someone's business plan. And then I got more deeply involved in the business. And I realized that I enjoyed telling these stories like a journalist when I was part of the story, when I was describing something that I was doing. And then it was motivating to almost make the story more interesting. So a lot of people look at like doing a business plan or an investor deck as, uh, as reactive, as something you do to describe what you've already done. But when you're an entrepreneur, I think it's incorporating that learning, doing something, describing it, the act of describing it teaches you what you could be doing differently to make the story more interesting, the business more compelling. And it's that cycle, I kind of got addicted to that. And then you see a little bit of success and that encourages you. That's fantastic. I love that idea of almost putting yourself in the center of the stories and, and kind of building from there. That's amazing. And like your storytelling has kind of continued like outside of like the business environment. You've also been involved with the moth for over five years. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, I uh, was a moth. I'm involved in the moth as an organization, but my, my key moment was as a storyteller. So for those who don't know, the moth is, uh, is uh, true stories uh, told live without notes. Um, and uh, you get up in front of a crowd of anywhere from a few hundred to a few thousand people, and uh, you tell a, a personal story, 15 minutes. Uh, and uh, boy, it sounds easy. That was hard. That was really hard. Um, the way people are often interested in this, if you've listened to the moth, um, the way uh, my story got started is I just sat down for drinks with the creative director of the moth, and we had been referred to each other just as people who might enjoy meeting each other. And she said, tell me about yourself, tell me your story. And I, I literally started like where I was born in my childhood. And um, she said, that, that thing. Okay, I'm just gonna take notes of that. Now, now keep going. Uh, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the specifics. They're always better than generality. So, uh, so I have a disabled younger brother that obviously had a great impact on me. And I mentioned that sometimes earlier. And then I talked about uh, sort of my adolescence. And then I talked about my bar mitzvah. And uh, she said, oh, that's an interesting story, actually, about your bar mitzvah. Um, did that have anything to do with your disabled brother? And I had never thought about it. And then in the recesses of my mind, I realized that there was, a, you can listen to it, I'm sure we'll have a link to it, but uh, there was an incredible link between these two, two things. And then I had this moment of doubt where I was like, those are two such personal things, talking about my brother and a very you know, personal moment in my coming of age. And she said, you know, the only way we could ever do a moth story is if it's vulnerable. And I would ask you to not really dig deep into the story and don't make up doubts, don't make up points of conflict, really think about things that you are not comfortable telling other people. And that's what wins people over. That's what makes the story compelling. And believe it or not, like in business, that's the case too. Every investor or potential client hears the same canned stories over and over. And people ask me, what, what makes people notice? What makes you stand out? And it's not a huge market size. It's not, you know, your patent. I mean, those are nice, you know. But if you can grab them with something that even if you're saying you don't know, you're vulnerable about some point of your, your journey where the outcome was not, you know, all A pluses. 
Uh, that is so much more interesting than just having win, 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 perfect, check, check, check. That's so true. I, I often uh, tell people in my workshop that the most boring stories are the ones where it's about awesome people having awesome lives and doing awesome things. We actually, yeah. it, it's almost like we have this innate want to root for underdogs and see people overcome challenges. And I think what you're saying there is so, so uh, accurate. Um, where it's almost like, I think in, in business, it's almost that fear of being too personal uh, and too open and, and too uh, vulnerable, so to speak, when they're trying to tell their stories. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Honestly, that's why I'm not addicted to Instagram. I think it's fine, but it's because every, it's, every, it's snapshots of everybody's best life. And, and that's the least interesting part of someone's story in my mind. I don't want to see that. I want to see what happened after the camera was off. <laughs> I, it's so true. And, you know, following on from that, then, like, you know, you've kind of touched on the, the mistake of like talking about like, oh, everything is perfect. And what are some of the other like common mistakes that you see startups in particular make when trying to tell their story? Yeah, I mean, I think um, when you have a complicated product or idea and pretty much everybody thinks they have, if you think you have something unique, probably the reason is you think it's so complicated and you spent so much time, you know, figuring it out that you need to go into a big list of features or technical specs or whatever that is. And the thing that's most important is to, and I hate the phrase dumb it down because it implies that people are dumb. They're not. We're all human beings. We want things at a human scale that you can relate to. And if, if I could give you just one example of one of the most challenging and rewarding companies that I've coached. So a few years ago, I had a company that was uh, in the chemical distribution space. And it was so arcane. It took me weeks to even get my head around what this company did. And I was the guy's lead mentor and he, was, uh, he wasn't born in the US, so he had a pretty thick accent. And I was just struggling. How is this guy gonna get up in front of hundreds of investors on demo day and get us excited about this. And um, uh, I realized that, you know, chemicals, we don't have to, the exciting part of this is not like which warehouse the chemicals are in. It's the, 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 the centrality of, of chemicals in our lives. Everything you see here, the desk, the, probably not the desk, but the, the computer, the, the chair, it's all made of chemicals. It's everyday life and it doesn't just, you know, come fully formed, right? And the guy started by talking about that, or actually he started and said, hi, my name is Jay and I have a chemical problem. And he showed a picture of uh, uh, the guy from Breaking Bad, uh, which got a big laugh. So he took this incredibly boring thing. He, he started with, uh, yeah, it sounds like a cheap joke, but it, it made him relatable. He had an accent, so it showed that, uh, you know, he was sort of uh, culturally clued in. Um, and then he related this very obscure thing to something that people, it was surrounding people everywhere. That is really fascinating because I, I always think that, you know, something like that, it isn't the easiest thing to communicate to a general audience, especially if like, you know, I mean, I have no history in chemicals. I know nothing about it. And I imagine that there's a lot of investors that would be in the same position as me. Uh, that is, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, I mean, what it did, what it did is we came into this thinking that only people who invest in chemicals would ever be interested in investing in this company. And what I decided we needed to do together, we decided is we needed to expand that to people who are interested in not just a good investment, but in the way the world works, which is everybody. Um, and and that's how we drew it out. And and he raised a substantial amount of money on that. That's incredible. Um, one of the things that's interesting about that as well is like that is a company that may not without them like kind of telling like a relatable story they may not like stick out for uh for everyday people they may not stick out to investors without that story you know for you working with era you're obviously trying to identify potential companies and then help them tell their story. But how do you actually identify those, those companies? Like what makes you take notice of startups and startup founders? Um, well, a lot of accelerators and investors say this, but I think we really live by this. It really is founders first. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a founder who can get up there, 
say something with conviction, make you frankly have charisma. They have, you know, you have to like them at least a little. Um, and uh, you have to believe that this is someone who's going to execute and be able to communicate what they're doing. Even if we're a little skeptical about the business or I would much rather have that person as one of our founders because I can coach a founder. What I can't do is if they're willing to change their business and grow and be coachable, it's coachability really, right? But if they are so stuck, if, if, if they don't have that change mentality, that openness, that charisma, then they're not gonna be able to change when something goes wrong and it always goes wrong something. So I really, and, and maybe this is shallow, but when I'm trying to decide between multiple companies, I almost close my eyes and think about what is it gonna be like to work with this person over the next four months, the program? Are they gonna be someone that I'm gonna look forward to meetings with or am I gonna dread them? And, you know, yeah, sure, there's some geniuses who have an awkward human interface and I can see that and adjust for that. Um, but uh, heck, I, I, not just me, investors, partners, everybody likes to work with people who, uh, who demonstrate flexibility and coachability and, and are likable and articulate so I think that trumps everything else. I'll forgive a lot of weaknesses in the business if the if the founder is just is just a, a winner. You know, I, I love that the coachability element is is so fascinating, and it almost sounds like that you know having a founder that's open to suggestions and open to new ideas. So I think like there's there's this almost like this weird glorification sometimes of the like the one person doing everything by themselves and like pulling themselves up. And it's like, actually, no, they, they often need mentors. They often need people around them to support them and coach them and get them to that level. Um, and I think that's- yeah, and, and, they, and they need a team. They need to be able to sort of learn from, from above. And I don't want to say below, but from the people they surround themselves, you know, we can, sometimes we'll love the founder, but then we'll meet the people, the co-founder or the CTO. And we don't see that they share the same mentality or we don't see that relationship. I mean, the one thing that when we're doing an interview, we'll veto them right away is if we sense any tension in the team, like they're not on the same page. This is such a hard journey to do a startup, such a slog that if you don't have everybody pulling in the same direction um, and they're always gonna have differences, but sort them out constructively and in a friendly way and from a good place and, and that's fine. But um, yeah, managing up and, and taking that coaching and, and learning from your team as well. And, you know, we've already heard about you working with this chemicals company, but like, do you have any other examples of like, or stories of a, a person or a group that you have coached and the success that you've seen? Like, what is your favorite story that's come from your work at ERA? Oh, so many, so <laughs> many. Uh, Let's see, I, um, just the last class, uh, I worked with uh, a solo founder who came up with a very innovative uh, chewing gum, which doesn't sound like the sexiest tech product. But again, but there is actually, she was managed to license a, a very innovative uh, formula of chemical that actually eliminates bad breath, doesn't just mask it. Um, and uh, she was, she's a solo founder, so there wasn't a big group and there are often a lot of challenges for solo founders that others don't. Uh, so I was really sort of an extension of her team. And she was totally on top of the actual business. So sometimes I come in and they need help running the business. She didn't need my help with that. She, she had that down cold. But how do you make, it's almost the opposite of, of chemicals, which sounds so, uh, so heavy. But you know, how do you tell the story of chewing gum and make it exciting and, and make it weighty? So we, we work together to find a balance between the science of you know, showing people just enough of the science to communicate that there's something real there without boring people because they don't need to know the details of that. And then also taking the idea of bad breath, which is you know, a source of some humor, which is, uh, uh, you know, a, a lighthearted thing, but also actually a very emotional thing because if you have bad breath, no one tells you. Um, you have to pit up, you know, uh, pick up on subtle signals like someone taking a step back or offering you a mint, maybe. Um, so that was a particularly challenging uh, investor deck to put together. 
Um, and I'm just really proud of the way that we figured out how to make somehow chewing gum seem more important and science sound less scary, but weight them both so that they work together as part of a story that makes her investable. And uh, sure enough, she's, uh, she's uh, bringing in the investments right now. I'll definitely have to interview her for this to get her. Uh, well, it's not, I'll give her a plug. It's called Mouth Off. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Uh, Brian, I know that you're busy and thank you so much for joining today. But uh, one last question for me, what is next for Brian? I am, uh, I'm enjoying working at ERA so much. Um, I have, think about sometimes going back and operating another company. Uh, I think about doing other things or consulting for companies. But frankly, what I love about working at ERA and why I want to do more and more and I could see staying there for a long time is uh, every twice a year, you get this whole new batch of 12 bright eyed, eager people who come in day one thinking they know everything. By day two, they realize they know nothing. <laughs> and then by the end of the program, we want them to know, know as much as they can again so that they can uh, fly out of the nest. I, I can't think of anything more rewarding than that. So uh, I'm, I'm thrilled and, and I just want to do keep getting better learning from each class because it's everyone's different and uh, just get better every time and, and keep doing this. That's so good. Well, Brian, thank you so much again for your time. Really appreciate it. My pleasure.